what is the church? The church is the people of God, powered by the Spirit of God, guided by the Word of God, working for the glory of God. This is the church. The church is not just a place. The church is the people. The church is not just a monument. It's a movement. The church is not just a building. It's a body. The church is not just an accessory. It's a necessity. This is the church. The Bible says the church is the hope of the world, the salt of the earth, and the city on a hill. The church is the family of God, the body of Christ, and light in the darkness. The church is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. The church is where all kinds of people, from all kinds of places, come together to forsake their sins and to worship their Savior. Where chains are broken and broken hearts are put back together, where prodigals come home and captives are set free, this is the church. Where blind eyes are opened and good news is preached, where the low are lifted up and the proud are brought low, where the lost are found and the helpless find help, where brothers and sisters can find love and acceptance from each other and from their Father in heaven, this is the church. Where the disciples of Jesus are built up in their most holy faith. The church is where the gospel is. The church is where grace is. The church is where God is. The church is you. The church is me. The church is all of us. This is the church. Well, good morning again to each one of you and excited that you all are here to worship Jesus with all of us. This is an exciting time, uh, a brand new year. Uh, we're the first Sunday in. So as of right now, you've made it every Sunday in 2024. Amen. <laughs> all right. It's a good thing. Well, listen, we're doing a brand new series talking about Hope Church family. And uh, and we, we brought out that video because we're talking about what the church is, and not just globally, but also locally. And, and we're, we're discussing the fact that the church is an amazing living organism. This is not just some building somewhere, some steeple somewhere. It's alive, and it moves to everywhere that we go to. It is God's design. The church belongs to Jesus, not any one pastor or any group of believers. It belongs to Jesus. This is His church. Hope Church NRV is one of many churches in this country, in this state, in this world that worships Jesus, but it is His church, not mine and not yours. We are part of it. So again, it's not about a physical building, but about the people, the individual people that make up that body. And everybody is different. Um, everybody makes up the church. And although there are individual assemblies and local assemblies, as we call them, local churches, there is this one body that in this one local assembly, you and I all make up its members. And you and I all bring something very special to the mix. But above and beyond even all that, you and I are family. It's different. It's not the same. And we'll, we'll illustrate that in a couple of ways a little bit later. But we believe here at Hope Church that the local church is the means by which God is accomplishing His purposes in the world. Followers of Jesus are partic participants in God's redemptive purposes throughout the church. So membership is meaningful. We have a covenant partner class. We call it the family room. If you've never attended the family room, we're going to do one later this month. I encourage you to be part of that. But in that family room, there's a packet of information. Some of it's boring. Some of it deals with bylaws and things like that. Other parts of it deal with exactly who we are and what we believe. And it deals with where we're going to go and how we're going to serve and how we're going to be part of that. In the very last part of that covenant partnership uh, book, so to speak, it's a small one. But in, in the very end of it, there are a few pages, and in those last couple pages, there are four things, basically, uh, that make us partners with Hope Church and partners of Hope Church. And that's what we're going to be going over the next four weeks, are those things. So we are a family, and as, as Hope Church, we covenant with God and with each other, too. Today is going to be protect the unity, okay? 
That's the one thing that all of us, if you're wondering, if you're not part of Hope Church yet, if you've taken the class and you haven't signed the document yet, hey, that, that's all right. But, it, but if you're wondering what we believe or what's important to us, and you're wondering where you fit in, here's, here's number one thing. Protect the unity of who we are and what we stand for and what we're believing in. And so there's going to be three things I'm going to go over today that show how we protect that unity. So number one, protect the unity by acting in love toward other members. Sounds super simple, right? Let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of an imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Now, the context of really what's going on here in first Peter is Peter's talking about being holy. You want to be holy like Jesus is holy and it refers to Levit- Leviticus eleven forty four and other passages you can go to. Um, but the idea that he gets to here and he uses the word at the beginning of verse 22 is to purify your souls. OK, Talking about being holy, that's the connection that brings this in and that brings him to how you purify your souls. Well, you purify your souls with brotherly love. You ever thought about it that way? You want to be holy, you want to be like God, then you need to actually love one another. Sounds super simple, but why do we struggle with it so much? Why is it so difficult to do? It is so much easier to be at odds with people, isn't it? It's so much easier to hate somebody. It's so much easier to blame or to point fingers but loving, well, that's tough at times. And haven't you heard about so-and-so who did such-and-such, and we can't, you know, you can't love that person. Yeah, the Bible says to love one another. It doesn't give any type of contingencies or any type of plan by which you wouldn't love this person. It says to love one another, period. All right? So let's, just, let's try this. In the morning time, generally speaking, you guys look in the mirror, right? When you're getting ready. Most of you. I hope you do. At least make sure there's nothing hanging out your nose. My wife will be happy I didn't use the B word. Okay, but anyway. Um, so, you know, you look in the mirror. You, kind of, you see yourself. How many of you look in the mirror and, and you, just, you just say, wow, I'm amazing. How many of you do that? All right. I figured I'd get one or two hands back there. And I wonder if you all are being for real or not. But anyway, I raised my hand just to see how many would go up, okay? The rest of you are like, nope, not me. I look, see all my blemishes, see all my faults and all my failures and all those things, you know. And then you go amongst other people. Now, when you're around other people, it is easier to point our fingers at them. Why? Because it makes you feel better about yourself. You know, when I was a teenager and I had zits all over my face, because that was me. I had a teenager with pizza face and zits all over my face and all kinds of things. And I'd always be concerned, that one big zit. You know, everybody was looking at it, right? You know, I'd go in a crowd and everybody, and you'd see their eyes, see? And I'd say to myself, see, they're looking right at it right now. I don't even want to be here, <laughs> you know, is, is what I would say. The truth of the matter is everybody saw my zit and they, and they were happy that they didn't have as many zits as me. So they were cool with it. You know, that's kind of where the truth of the matter was. Um, but they all had their own problems, whether it was their own zits or whether it was their chicken legs or whatever it is. Everybody's got their own thing and their own sets of problems. And we're called to love one another in spite of all of it, okay? So we're called to love one another no matter how we look, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been. The Bible, again, doesn't give any type of plan to not love somebody. In the, in the opposite, it says to love one another. And that phrase, love one another, is all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is all over the place. I think it's almost a hundred times it's used, the one another phrase is used in the New Testament. And I want to say that a third of those references are in reference to loving one another. So somewhere around 25 to 33 times, somewhere in that ballpark, the Bible says love one another. You think it's important? I think we hold higher th- other things to high importance and only say things once or twice. Something that says 30 something times, we need to take note of it. Love one another. And then it uses the word earnestly. You know, um, love one another earnestly, the end of verse 22, from a pure heart. That word earnestly simply means zealously, fervently, eagerly. It's just an adverb that attaches to the verb. How do you love one another? Fervently. How do you love one another? Zealously. In other words, you got to try. you got to work at this. It's not easy. To be honest, there are some people that are fairly hard to love. Just going to be honest. And when you look in the mirror, you're looking at one of them, okay? Um, That's the truth of the matter. It's always hard to love somebody else. And there are people that are really tough. 
But he uses this phrase um, in verse 23, since you have been born again. Now, I find that interesting. Of course, the phrase we understand, the phrase is not literally in the mother's womb again. It's, it's about becoming a new creature in Christ. It's about placing your faith in Jesus. In John 3, you've been born again. All right. But it talks about this not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Y'all read that? That's interesting. Because what's happening is it's designating us as part of the family of God. It's an imperishable seed, something that you will have forever. And so guess what? The Christian that you can't stand the most, that you even wonder whether they're a Christian or not, and that you certainly have a hard time loving, guess what? They're also one of God's children and part of His eternal, everlasting seed. Which makes us all what? One big happy family. Well, let me take off one of those words. One big family, okay? That's what it makes us. And the Bible is saying that we need to be a happy one. We need to love one another. All right? That's what it's calling us to do. This family is not like any other family. You know, to be honest with you, you can go to any, most of us and you can find faults within your own family. If you're married, you probably find faults within your in-laws, right? Uh, it's easy to do. It's easy, again, to point fingers. But I'm going to go ahead and point mine right at my own for a second. All right, my family is a complete, absolute mess. My side of the family, all right, for over 15 years, I never talked with my dad. He didn't know I existed, had no idea the fact that I even had a wife, how many kids I had, or what state I lived in. That was my dad. Nine years ago, we rekindled that relationship, and my mom said, done. So now I haven't seen her in almost 10 years, okay? It's not just my mom, though. It's actually the rest of my family that are really good people. We just don't see each other. My family is non-existent. I came down south, became part of this family, and Tammy and Chappie and many others. They took me in like their son. And I've actually got a family now because I have them. But I don't have a family when it comes to my own family. So it seems. Now I'm rekindling my relationship with my sister, and we're working on all these other families. But listen, mine is messed up. They hate one another. There's years of resentment. There's no contact, major grudges. And some of you may be able to relate to having a family member like that or a whole family like that. And I point that out not to say, woe is me and everybody give me a pity party. That's not at all. I point all that out because when I think about a family, I think of all the screw ups and the mess ups and the problems and all this. And God wants me to be a family to you but he doesn't want me to be a family like that. He wants us to be a family like I have with the rest of my in-laws in Virginia and the surrounding areas. He wants the family to be even better than that, to actually, really, truly love one another. Work through our problems. When they arise, we deal with them. And we realize that all of us are part of this same family. We all make up sons and daughters of God, and we're in this together. So why then do we always point our finger and why do we hate? We do it because it's much easier to do that than it is to live in love. There are going to be issues in God's family, but I challenge you here at Hope Church NRV in this local assembly, in this body, let's focus on loving one another and what that really means. And let's not let people slip through the cracks. John chapter 13, Jesus teaches this. And I definitely want to go here because he says it multiple times. But uh, in chapter 13 down all the way to verse 33. And before I actually read this, the context is, is he's washed the disciples' feet. This section of John is his last evening. And it's a large section. If you want to kind of know what happened leading up to the crucifixion and the resurrection and all that. John is like one of the best places to go. Because you go here in these, this chapter 13 and you go all the way to the end of the book. And he's focused on that last night and the last few days there as he's raising from the dead um, but you got again you got the washing the disciples feet you got the last supper they just talked about who's going to betray and then he says in verse 33 little children talking to disciples yet a little while i am with you they didn't really understand that but that's okay you will seek me and just as i said to the jews so now i also say to you where i am going you cannot come a new commandment i give to you that you love one another. That's all he says. That you love one another. And he goes on, he'll qualify, just as I have loved you. And they would begin to see that in his 
crucifixion and resurrection, he says, you are also to love one another. Then he makes this statement. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We're told by Jesus, this new commandment, this great piece of information, the very last thing that I will teach you that matters most when I'm gone is that you guys love one another. That's what Jesus says. Christians are now, in the, according to these verses, they're identified with how they love. Check it out. Verse 35 again. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You're going to stand out. You're going to be different. A Christian should not be the same. A, a non-Christian family, an institution that meet, that's, that's in the house, that has children and all that, has problems, of course, like that. But that, that non-Christian family should not be showing more love to other people than a Christian family. A Christian family should be the one by which we even can define love because they're exemplifying who Jesus is in all of their actions and their dealings with other people. And yet here in the church, we have, even in this location, because it's going to be every single church you ever go to, so if you want to leave here, go find another place that doesn't have any problems. We'll see you. Good luck with that one. It'll never happen, okay? You'll always find problems, all right? But the idea is this. There'll always be, and we have people that are fighting. We have gossip, which we're going to deal with in a few moments. There's going to be church splits. There are judgments from one person to another. There's do's and there's don'ts. Church people, can I just be honest? They're mean, some of the hardest things I've ever dealt with in life, some of the deepest hurts I've ever had is church hurt. It sucks, and i got no other way of saying it. It's bad, okay? People are mean. And then you wonder why these people on the outside look at this, this church or any other church and say, your church is full of hypocrites. <laughs> we are. We're full of a bunch of hypocrites. We're told by Jesus, this new commandment, I give you to love one another, and then we just don't. And something happens and we just write somebody off and they go off and live their life and do whatever else apart from Jesus, apart from the church. And it's because we couldn't love them through their problems. Does that sadden you? Because it does me. And I want to be honest with you. I want to be a church that's not like any of that. I want to have problems because we're going to have problems. But I want to have problems that are dealt with. I want to have problems that people love each other through. And that we can actually be a testimony, not just to an unbelieving world, but also to a believing world. That such things like Jesus said can actually happen. People can love one another. And people can keep unified in a church. I want to be the exception. I'm not going to go to Philippians 2, but just simply to reference it because it really fits perfectly with this idea. And if I was preaching a whole message on just this one point, we would certainly be there in Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. But it talks about being unified, being of one accord, of one mind, thinking of other people better than yourself, putting yourself lower than somebody else, exemplifying humility and all those things. And he uses Jesus in verse 5 and following as the example. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How? That he gave himself up for us. That he died in our place. Well, that goes right along with what he is saying here. Just as I have loved you, you're supposed to love one another in that exact way. So we're supposed to hum hum humble our ourselves and come underneath other people and be able to even lay our life down for somebody because we love them. First John chapter, um, chapter 4 verse 21 says this. And this commandment we have from him, this is, of course, John who heard what we just read, okay? Whoever loves God must also love his brother, all right? Whoever loves God must also love his brother. In the next section, we'll hit on some verses that might go hand in hand with all of this. But how in the world are we going to sit here and praise Jesus, sing to him, say out loud, put on our Facebook or Instagram post that we love God? And we're not willing to treat our brother well? The Bible says you can't do that. So here's the bottom line. Don't dare say you love Jesus and are unwilling to love one another. Because if you do that, you're lying to yourself and everybody else who's witnessing it. And the truth is, you really can't love God unless you're willing to love one another. Let that be a way in which we, we look at Hope Church that we're going to protect our unity by doing our best to love one another. 
We're also going to protect our unity by refusing to gossip. That's the second point here, by refusing to gossip. So I'm going to take you to a few passages in the Old Testament, and specifically to Proverbs, which has all kinds of wisdom and wise things to say. And so it says here in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13, Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps the thing covered. All right, that's, that's pretty powerful words being said here. It talks about, again, whoever goes about slandering, and that is a word we'll see in the next passage, is oftentimes translated gossip. Um, so whoever goes about gossiping or slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps the thing covered. No reason going out to say it to everybody unless you just want to tear somebody apart. All right, chapter 16, um, verse 28 says this, a dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. Y'all probably already got somebody in mind right now. <laughs> you probably can think of when this may have even happened to you. It's been done to you or you've done this to somebody else. You spread strife and, and between two people who were once close, now they're no longer friends. Why is that? Because of gossip. Because of slander. It ruins friendships. It, it destroys people. And can I say without, without a shadow of a doubt, it kills churches. One of the fastest things to happen is through gossip. All right, I'm going to take you to another passage in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 26. And we'll land here for just a few moments. It says in verse 20, For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there's no whisper, quarreling ceases. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. The words of a whisper are like delicious morsels. They go down to the inner parts of the body. I read that exact same verse in another place in Proverbs. So it's, it's important. It says it multiple times. But here in verse 20 again, the lack of wood, the fire goes out. Now you all know me, or at least those of you that have been around here a while, I like fires. I'm kind of a pyro. Um, last time I lit something on fire, I think, I have to admit, unfortunately, it was during a ban. And I did not know it was during a ban. So... That was my bad, okay? Um, my wife's not going to like I just said that. But anyway, that's what happened, okay? And lo and behold, later, I was out doing some things, came back with the four-wheeler. I was just going to make sure everything was good to go. And all of a sudden, I look over, and there's this, like, 40-foot tree that fell down. Why? Because it was an old dead tree that one little, one little piece got over to it, and, and, and it lit it on fire, and it burned it down. I was kind of hoping for a good forest fire, you know. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyhow, uh, it was a bad deal. So I, I had to go. I went to the creek. I don't know how many five-gallon buckets of water I got to put that tree out. Um, but, but went and got it, and everything was good to go. No more thing. I did destroy two of my lawn chairs, though. They were going to go into fire one day. They're gone now. Um, so anyway... It has nothing to do with the sermon, um, except for the fact there's a lack of wood, okay? The lack of wood, the fire goes out, all right? If you don't have any wood, you know, the fire's going to go away, okay? But where there's no whisper, the quarreling ceases. Where there's no one who gossips, the infighting stops. When there's nobody to slander, there seems to be no more problems. You see that? Proverbs, I love the Proverbs. Sometimes the, the word pictures and the, the pictures that are given are so clear. Listen, if you don't have wood, you don't have a fire. If you don't have gossip, you don't have fighting and infighting and quarreling and slander and all those kind of things as well. It kind of reminds me um, when I was in high school years ago, and, and some of you may have heard the story, but I had a friend named Vincent. Uh, Vincent Gonzalez, okay? I, I love the kid, all right? No, he's not a kid anymore. But um, Really cool guy. He was, uh, I believe, from Spain or Portugal, that area. And um, anyway, long story short, he was picked on unlike anybody else. Um, everybody liked to pick on Vincent. He had this really, really big black hair. And, and the hair was um, kind of like Einstein. And the funny part was Vincent was as smart as Einstein. I mean, so he got picked on so much for that. The other thing is he didn't help matters because when you walk up to somebody and you do this, and then you put it in their face like this, I'm just, that's just not cool. Anybody who does that, can I just help you out? Just don't walk up to your friends in high school and think that this is going to get you anywhere. Star Trek, yeah, look at me, okay? It doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't help you with your friends, all right? And so I try to tell Vincent that, but it was to deaf ears when it came to that. He was a huge Trek fan, okay, and all this stuff. But what ended up happening was many times these people would pick on him, and Vincent would grab that huge lock of hair, and he would just pull, and he'd scream, and he'd shout, 
And he gave such a reaction that what do you think all the high school kids did? Continue to pick on him because they watch Vincent pull his hair out. That's pretty cool, you know? Here's the bottom line. They'd get a reaction. And when they get a reaction, they keep on doing it. I end up telling Vincent one day, Vincent, you just need to ignore it, man. Um, don't, don't give in to what they're doing. And he tried, and sometimes it got better, and I think he went back to pulling his hair. Um, but anyway, you know, not to give a reaction. But we don't need to even focus on that if, one, we're willing to love one another, and, two, we're willing not to talk bad about other people. And so this goes right along, very close right along, with James chapter 3, which deals with the, the whole idea of a bridal, a small bridal controls a horse, and it goes along with a, a ship, just a rudder. That little small rudder on a ship indicates which direction the ship goes. And then James teaches that the same thing with our tongue. That little tiny tongue, as small of a member as it is, you compare it to like your thigh, you know, as far as a muscle is concerned. Your thigh is so much bigger than your tongue, but yet the, the tongue controls everything about you, James is teaching. And so I actually want to go there and read that. It says um, in James, <clears throat> we'll go to chapter 3 and look at verse 5, just a starting place. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. See the connection there that you can kind of go back in, in the Proverbs. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Oh my goodness. We just got like really deep really fast, didn't we? The tongue's a bad deal. Okay? Controlled by ourselves. Understand that. But as we go on, it says, Every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed, and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Man, those are some words. Have you ever had poison come out your mouth? You don't have to answer that out loud. You don't have to raise your hand. I just want you to think. Has poison ever come out your mouth? Well, let me rephrase it. Has it come out your mouth in the last two weeks? Because I know it has before then at some point. Okay? You've said something so evil to somebody, it just tears them completely down. It hurts them to the core. It doesn't matter whether your love language is words of affirmation or not. People don't like to hear bad things about themselves. And yet we do it and we spit it out maybe because it makes us feel better at the moment or because we want to get back at somebody or because we're just so angry and we can justify it so many ways. That tongue can absolutely kill somebody. We have to realize this. It goes on to say, with it, talking about the tongue, verse 9, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. How do, how do you do that? We're made in God's image. How do you look at one of us? That happens all the time. I get it, but I'm just making the statement. We can praise God, who is the creator of all things and created us to be in His image, and then we look at His image bearers and we curse them. Why does that happen? It shouldn't happen, is the idea. From the same mouth come blessings and cursings, my brothers. These things ought not to be so. So let's kind of really hone in on gossip for a second. What is gossip? Talking about somebody when they're not present? That's normally the definition that's given. They're not around, you're talking about them, you must be gossiping. I'm here to say, no, that's not gossip, okay? Why? Because bosses are going to discuss employees. Is that gossip? You think the boss is really trying to slander their employee? No, they might be looking at their job performance or taking a look at the raise that they're going to give them. Talking about them is not a bad thing. Two friends talking about another friend's problem. You think that's gossip? Not always, because maybe the friends are really trying to find a way that they can help their brother or sister. Could be a good thing. So we can't make the definition about people talking about somebody when they're not present. That that's not enough. We have parents to talk about their children when they're not present. How they're going to handle so-and-so's behavior or punishment or something like that. Is that gossip? Because by definition, if I just simply say uh, that talking about someone when they're not present is gossip, well then we gossip all the time. Now, I do think we gossip all the time, but I don't think that's the definition. Okay, here's a better definition. Bearing bad news behind someone's back out of a bad heart. Bearing bad news behind someone's back 
out of a bad heart. You don't know whether the information that you have is good. Whether it's true, whether it's false, could be true. Then you get the whole ad- adage, well, if it's true, then it's not gossip. Come on, really? You still got the bad heart and the bad intent. So if you've got the bad heart and the bad intent, then if you're talking about somebody behind their back, you're by definition participating in gossip. It's the intent of the heart. It's the desire that we actually have within our being to hurt somebody else. Literally, it's bad news, which is the opposite of the gospel because the word gospel means good news. When you are gossiping, you are participating in the opposite of what the gospel means and stands for. Think about it that way. We're slandering, we're tearing down somebody with our words. And you know, it happens in the church all kinds of times. A pastor makes a decision and somebody doesn't like it, you know, or says something like right now that you may not agree with. And so what happens? We leave here, we go find somebody else. Can you believe Pastor Jay said such and such? You know, he's just, he's just mean, you know, and you go on and say whatever it is that you're going to say. That can happen, all right? In a church, that actually happens more than you would think. Someone might be caught in, in a sin and And everybody wants to know. It becomes the talk for the next two weeks of how somebody did X or Y. And then everyone's talking about it. We're we're tearing each other down. That's not helping. Do we need to address the problem? Yes. Do we call sin, sin? Absolutely. But what's the first thing we talked about? Loving one another. So when someone's in a fault, what does the Bible say? Bear one another's burdens. Help one another out. Let's figure this thing out. Don't go behind their back and start talking about them. Because that does nothing but divide. That is the opposite of unity. So we need to protect the unity. You want to know the juicy details about someone that you and another person aren't getting along with? Or, or maybe you know somebody and who, who used to be your best friend, is no longer your best friend, but is someone else's best friend. So you're going to find your way in between them because you're going to ruin it because they used to be your best friend. You're a slanderer. You're a gossip. You need to stop. Okay? There are going to be things that happen here at Hope Church, decisions that we make. And I'll give you one, um, not because I think there's going to be any any type of uh, feedback on this. And that's why I think it'd be a good illustration. We just made some changes within our children's program. All right. And within the changes we made, we've started a brand new preschool class. And we're excited about that. And I'm going to explain that in just a moment. But in so doing, we took the mother's room and we moved it into the nursery. Well, somebody could say, you don't care about our mothers anymore you know uh, you don't care about women that are going to feed their children no no it's the complete opposite okay because here's the deal this is our thinking as we go through this that we're allowing the mothers to continue feeding because there's only a few of them right now which we're praising God for every one of them but we're allowing the mothers to feed within the nursery nursing mothers in the nursery that kind of makes sense doesn't it right and then for the two or three or four that are doing that we think about the 15 children who are the the preschoolers who are stuck with the nursery and you can't have a viable lesson because all the babies are screaming. They're in one room. It's crazy. So what have we done? We've moved it out so now we can focus on giving the gospel and teaching our children how to worship at such a young age. Okay? But I'm here to tell you right now that that's the kind of thing that can easily be misconstrued, can be turned into gossip, can you believe they don't care about, you know, that kind of a thing where if you actually would come and talk to the person, whoever it is, who you may be, uh, you know, wondering about, you'll find out other reasons why they did it. So going behind the back and saying mean things about somebody else, forget me as a pastor for a moment, it'd be anybody, that is slander and that is gossip and we don't need to do that. Instead, we want to build one another up. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, it says this, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. By definition, the exact opposite of gossip. Okay, think about unity. Think about us as a church covenanting together partnering together to love one another and to refuse to gossip about each other, okay? How many problems would we completely get rid of? By this point, almost all of them, 
And that's what we're trying to do. So at Hope Church, we're going to protect our unity by doing our best to love one another and to refuse to gossip. And lastly, by following leadership. So by following leadership. Now, there are many leaders at Hope Church. There are teachers, there are facilitators in small groups, there are team leaders amongst the different teams that we have here on Sunday morning. There's other team leaders that are involved in evangelism and other events that we do and other things like that. We have elders, we have a pastor, all those, all those forms of, quote, leadership. There's a lot of them. But each leader is in a position to spiritually influence your life, all right? And I hope that more leaders will arise and we'll have more people doing the very same thing. They're not trying to do it out of force, but out of love and a desire to see you grow closer to Jesus. And so I just have a few short places we're going to go to here on this topic, and then, then we're going to end for today. But it says this, in Hebrews thirteen seven: remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Okay? We think about the, the leaders that we have. You know who is a leader over you. You know who's spiritually guiding your life. And, and it says to consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. You know, whoever the writer is of Hebrews is speaking a lot like Paul does in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, when he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. All right? All of us should be saying that. In a way, every one of us should be a leader to somebody. I don't care if you think you're a follower, I can guarantee you you're leading somebody. Somebody's watching you. Teenager you who might be at school right now and you think nobody else follows you, that you're not very important or that, you know, that's not who you are. I want you to know that they know you attend this youth group and that they're looking at you for leadership. All right. Adults, the same way you have it with your children, you have it amongst your job. There's so many different forms of leadership that each one of you maintain and possess. And in all those forms, we want to live a life as such that people will be able to follow us. And as they follow us, they're actually following Jesus. How cool is that? That can happen at a secular job just the same as it can happen here in this church, as it can happen anywhere else. As people follow us, they're following Jesus. Leaders have to be able to give an account. Look at verse 17 and 18. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So this idea that they, they have to be able to give an account. You know, they, they want to, they want what's best for you. There's not a moment, I can just tell you from my perspective, because I can't tell you anybody else's heart. I know from my perspective as the pastor of this church that hands down, I want every one of you to grow closer to Jesus. I don't want any of you to act like me where I'm not acting like Jesus. But if I can do something like Jesus, I want you to act like me. Okay, I want to be able to exemplify that to you. I want you to live a life where you grow closer to Jesus, where worship is more real to you, where Jesus is more real to you than ever before. And I want you to have a relationship with him unlike you've ever had. That is my heart. I guarantee you. It's the thing I go to bed thinking about each night. How do we obtain this more in this congregation with these people? How do I get it across? How do I teach? How do I live myself in such a way that they can see and so forth? Not for one moment do I think to myself, I'm going to destroy this whole thing. I'm going to kill everything. I'm going to destroy everybody. I'll make it their lives stink. They don't know who God is. Really? A pastor is going to think that? I don't think I've met a pastor yet that has that mentality. Okay? And so I don't care how bad they are speaking. I don't care how bad they are leading. I can tell you one thing. All the pastors that I've been privileged to know at least want you to know Jesus better. They all do. Every leader of any ministry, of any sort, wants you to be in a place where your faith grows. Why? Because leaders have to give an account. One day, I myself and many of you, you're not a pastor, but still, many of you, because of your leadership, in whatever capacity, will have to give an account as to how you led other people. This new preschool ministry has a teacher in there teaching without the noise of the nursery right now. And she will have to give an account for how well she leads those children. Same thing for the teacher in here. Same thing for those in there. Same thing for all of our small groups. For all of our teams that are putting people together that are leading people in any form spiritually. We all have to give an account. And every one of us here to some degree, whether you have a team beneath you or not, will have to give an account to what you've done and how you've led. 
And so it says, let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And then verse 18, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. In all things, that is. So pray for your leaders. Romans chapter 14, in closing, says this. And I'll go to chapter 14 and verse 19. Where it says, so then, after all these things, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. At Hope Church, we want peace. We want unity. We want to be able to love one another through any of our problems, any of our difficulties. We want to be able to refuse to gossip. And we want to be able to follow the leadership as the leadership follows Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for all you've done. We pray that you would work in a mighty way and just help us as we lead people. Help us as a church as we grow. And, uh, and Lord, help us to be able to do some of these things. Loving one another is not easy. It's, it can be tough. It can be very difficult. On top of that, refusing to gossip can be tough because it just feels good sometimes to, to gossip. It feels good to hurt somebody, tear somebody down. But instead, we need to build unity. And Lord, on top of all that, we need to be able to follow the leadership as the leadership follows you. So help us to do all those things. May you get all the praise and glory. And we love you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must